Hello, uh, welcome to Temple University Japan. Um, I'm Robert Dejaric from the Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies. Uh, just a few things. Uh, if you can get an invitation directly from us, give us your business card. Also, these events are free, uh, but they're not cost free. Um, so you can um, contribute to them uh, by donating money to our boxes and soon a group of very friendly gentlemen uh, with tattoos uh, will come to ask you for contributions. Um, so we're extremely happy to have Professor Alec Murphy. You came to hear him, uh, not me. So uh, Alec, the floor is yours. If you have a mobile phone, turn it on silent. Thank you. I'm all in favor of not, not long introductions. That's great. Well, uh, thank you for all to all of you for coming out on such a rainy night to uh, hear a little bit about one of my favorite subjects. Well, maybe my favorite subject, which is 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 geography. And of course, uh, being a geographer, I'm concerned with things environmental. I was aware of the the drought that Tokyo is having, so had to arrange for some rain tonight to start addressing the drought situation here uh, uh, in in Tokyo. Um, so. I'm going to talk to you a bit in a very general way about, about geography this evening. And I will start off by saying, usually I don't use a microphone, so this is a bit intimidating. I've talked to groups of 200 without a mic microphone. But, um, I'll, I'll start out by saying that the, the very term geography, uh, in many people's minds, connotes a, a rather old-fashioned and somewhat boring subject. Many people, when they think about geography, they, they think about, well, just memorizing a map like this. You know, if you, you, you even see surveys that talk about people's geographical ignorance or how much they know about geography. And it's often, you know, can they put Mexico in the right place on, on, on a map like this? And uh, the fact that geography is a bit, uh, uh, is an older subject and it has even been marginalized to some degree in uh, institutions of higher education, particularly in the United States, but actually in other uh, parts of the world as well, we're in a situation right now where most people's conceptions of geography is quite limited and with little appreciation for how thinking geographically about the challenges facing the world in the 21st century is actually incredibly important. The problem that I would sketch to you tonight is really twofold. On the one hand, it's a very limited sense of what geography is or what geography might be. As I say, it's kind of memorizing a map like this. On the other hand, it's a rank ignorance of the subject. Uh, you, you know the, the kind of amusing depictions you get of uh, this kind of rank ignorance. The problem of showing these kinds of maps is that no one will pay any attention to me. You'll only be looking at the map. But um, it, it's, uh, it's something that actually our, our host tonight, uh, when we were exchanging emails, uh, was reminding me it's not even just a property of, of U.S. Stu students who don't have a good conception necessarily of the world. He was recounting to me a, a French student who was asked to uh, locate three or, or identify three Pacific Rim countries uh, that were south of the equator, and uh, the first choice was Cuba. So, uh, you know, you, you do have these very... Uh, unfortunately limited conceptions of just basically how the world is organized uh, that are out there. And even in the face of the kinds of current events that might attract our attention to what we don't know about the world. There was a famous quote by Ambrose Bierce that war is, is God's way of teaching American ge Americans geography. You know, so say they, a conflict breaks out and all of a sudden the tension focuses on a particular part of the world and we know something about it. But even that doesn't help a lot. Just uh, two or three years after the United States uh, went into Iraq, there was a survey that was done of uh, young Americans, 18 to 24 years old, asking them to put just basic things like uh, Afghanistan on a map and Israel or, or identify US states. And the, the uh, results were fa fairly appalling. So we're all kind of aware of this latter issue, of that people just don't have much of a mental sense of how the world is organized and even where basic things are. But that's really uh, just a very, I think, thin layer of the problem that, is, uh, that I would, would associate with, with geographical ignorance. It's a thin layer because just knowing some place names by themselves and 
being able to put them in a proper place on a map is really not all that useful or, or helpful uh, an understanding unless it's accompanied with some ways of thinking and understanding that go with geographical thinking. Now, I don't want to belittle the importance of just knowing where place names are. It's nice when the media gets these things right. I remember seeing, turning on, seeing this uh, CNN broadcast three, uh, three weeks after 9-11. Uh, they were talking about terrorist cells, cells in Berlin, and I was struck to see that Switzerland had actually taken over the Czech Republic. Um, <laughs> I, I, got, I got a new sense of continental drift from this map uh, from, uh, from Fox News, where I realized you know, how far Egypt had gone in just a, a very short, uh, short, short period of time. I have a whole collection of these. If you have any you want to send my way, I'd love to add them to the collection. But what's actually more disturbing than these kinds of mistakes is actually when we're confronted with a geographical image like this one and we don't find it at all curious. So this was a map of a cold air mass, in theory, that moved into the northern United States in the winter of 1997. And you can see the configuration of that cold air mass. Let's see if I can get my... See the configuration of the cold air mass here? And you can see the remarkable... Uh, uh, configuration of that air mass. I don't know how many of you have had courses in meteorology or climatology, but air masses don't really have these nice sharp north-south boundaries to them. <laughs> you know, what's go either this is a very poor map, or the north and sorry, the north and South Dakota border guards did an excellent job of keeping all of that <laughs> cold air over there in Minnesota. Um, well, of course, uh, it, it's it's a bad map. And it's a bad map because it purports to show something that is uh, of a natural, uh, it purports to show a natural phenomenon, but it's using a political pattern to show that map without even, with that phenomenon, without even sort of considering what is being hidden and what's revealed when you're trying to map something in that way. It suggests when we map things in this way that we've lost our ability to think in considered geographic ways about the planet on, on which we live. So, it, to me, it suggests that we've actually lost a lot since the Greeks coined the term geography. Geography is a Greek term, geo, the earth, graphi, graphene, to, to write about, about the earth. And when the, Greek, uh, the early Greek explorers were moving out from the Greek mainland and started to explore the eastern shores of the Mediterranean and find their way up into the Black Sea, they were trying to make sense of the world in which uh, Greece was situated, not just to put place names in the right place, but to try to understand why certain things were found in one place and not in another. Why do we find these plants over here but not over there? Why do the people speaking this language uh, seem uh, uh, living here uh, seem quite similar to ones uh, fairly distant, but then other ones are speaking an entirely, uh, entirely different tongue? Why are settlements found in certain places along the shores of the Mediterranean, but not in other places along the Mediterranean? And it was the effort to try to ask and answer those kinds of questions that gave birth to uh, the discipline that we now refer to uh, as geography. And so what the Greeks were concerned with was not just, can you put the Peloponnesus in a correct place on a map? But can you think geographically about the world? Can you use your understanding of differences from place to place to try to make sense of how the or world is organized and how it's put together? So it's not just then about this, kind, this memorization exercise. And in fact, I would suggest that there are at least four basic components to thinking geographically about the world that, again, go far beyond place name memorization. One is a concern with spatial patterns and relationships. Spatial, S-P-A-T-I-A-L, not the way my mother-in-law from Southeast Ohio uh, pronounces the word special. Isn't that <laughs> spatial, she'll say. Uh, but to try to understand how things are organized in space. A second is the nature and character of different places and regions. You know, we study economies, we study plants, we study molecular structures. Well, places may be worthy, worth, worthy of study as well. Human env environment interactions. If you're interested in trying to understand the character of places and regions, that means thinking about the relationships among phenomena in individual places, and that can, that's a, a way that often brings the physical and the human together. And then finally, how where something happens 
affects what happens, that is to say, the locational context. And in pursuit of those kinds of concerns, geographers, of course, use a variety of tools and methods. One of those is to look at the landscape itself and use the landscape as a source of information and ideas. You know, we're used to thinking about texts, <coughs> written documents, as sources of information and ideas. But landscapes as well tell us stories. They tell us stories about what's happened, about cultural and social priorities, about how things might, might be happening. Um, geographers, of course, also make use of maps and increasingly the ability to, uh, to map things in computer environments and use so-called geographic information systems to analyze the spatial relationships among phenomena is opening up whole new worlds uh, of, uh, of investigation and, and analysis. And I put this one up here not to make you sleepy, although it might have that effect. It's sort of hip hypnotic, but it's an interesting visualization, map visualization of fire, uh, fires in the American West, human started versus lightning started, and this data set now has been used in all sorts of management applications and so forth. And then there's all sorts of other kinds of geographic visualizations which are quite useful for making sense of what's going on uh, in, in the world. The ability to model what a stream would look like with and without a dam now is it's actually a very useful management tool when you're trying to figure out whether to build a dam in some cases or what are the consequences of removing a dam, which is increasingly an issue that we're confronting um, in, in the United States. So these core geographical concerns and the tools we use to try to address these geographical concerns are, of course, ones that historically have led to some profound insights uh, on how the world works. Uh, we can go back to our ancient Greeks, a guy like Eratosthenes, careful observations of the different angle of the sun in north and south Egypt eventually leads to an ability to not only theorize that the earth is round, but to calculize, calculate um, its circumference with remarkable uh, accuracy. On through the early ideas about continental drift, which came from careful observations of rock types on either side of the Atlantic, or even just the more casual recognition that the western and eastern sides of the Atlantic and looked like they fit together in some ways uh, put geographers at the forefront of, of that exercise. But my effect effective argument for this evening is that many of the problems that we are confronting in the 21st century are ones that cry out for the kind of thinking and analysis that go with, uh, with the geographical ways of approaching the world. And to make that point, I want to take those four conceptual angles that I think geography brings uh, to the table and look at how those might be relevant to some of the issues and problems uh, that we're facing today. And um, Robert asked me to try to stay to about 30 minutes, so I'm going to try to do this relatively briefly, but that will give us a lot of time for, for questions and answers. So um, let's start with uh, spatial patterns and, and relationships. I suppose every introduction, introductory geography text uses, uh, or practically every introductory human geography text uses the classic example of a London physician faced with a cholera outbreak in the middle of the 19th century. No one could figure out what to do about this cholera outbreak until the cases of cholera were put on a map by Dr. John Snow. And of course, what he recognized when he put those cases on, the, on a map was that they, most of them clustered around a particular well. When the well was closed, the cholera epidemic subsided. The epidemiology wasn't understood, but what was, was understood was, well, now we can see there's probably a culprit involved how we understand what that culprit is came from a very simple kind of geographic analysis. Well, fast forward to the 20th, 21st century, and of course, among the major issues of the day uh, are, are epidemics of various sorts. And the kinds of geographic analysis that can be done uh, of these has shed fundamental light on transmission issues, gender differences, uh, place differences in, in the epidemiological challenges that we're facing. This particular one uh, showing HIV distribution in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, different distributions for men and women gave us some insights into some of the social factors that were affecting the spread of HIV AIDS uh, that uh, transcended simply the, the physical factors in, involved. And this is all getting increasingly complicated and sophisticated 
as the old ways of just mapping disease clusters. They are giving way to more sophisticated ways of understanding what's going on in the highly mobile world in which we live. In many cases, to simply map where people develop a certain kind of cancer doesn't tell you a whole lot if they were exposed to the to uh, the, the, the toxin that ultimately created the cancer 10, 15, 20 years ago. But now, dynamic GIS systems are, are being developed, in this case, one from, from Finland, the uh, southern province in Finland, to help us understand um, what's happened uh, to, uh, by putting mobility into the picture to the spread of, or the development of disease in, in places. Well, let's move now to something more uh, geopolitical in nature. My particular specialty is political geography. So I'm interested in the political organization of space, the relationship between political patterns and other, uh, and other kinds of patterns. And so in this very different area, area, we can consider for a moment how geographic understanding can be so important and how I've actually the failure to think geographically about the world has had such significant consequences just over the course of the last uh, t t 10 to 20 years. Uh, the map on the left is a, it, there is a very, very simplified map of ethnic distributions in, in Iraq. It's a map that got uh, virtually no attention at the time that the US blundered into Iraq in, in 2003. So some very simple things that we might have been thinking about at the time were completely ignored, such as the relationship between where the oil resources were in the country, in the Kurdish north, and in the Shia South, as opposed to where the group that had the dominant political position leading up to the, the invasion was located in the center. The failure to think even in simple ways about those kinds of spatial relationships had profound consequences in terms of the, the policy decisions that were made that we're living with the results of right now. And this could be the subject of a whole lecture unto itself, but in my effort to stay with the time frame, I'll just throw that out as a teaser and we can certainly pursue it. Uh, during, during the Q&A. But the, this kind of, of way of analyzing the spatial characteristics of territories and, and conflicts um, can be really quite key and can help us head off some of the problems that we've seen in the past when we fail to think uh, geographically about such issues and problems. Take just uh, the example in the 1990s of the partitioning of Bosnia along uh, uh, after the outbreak of, of conflict uh, along ethnic lines, it was proposed by uh, U.S. Secretary of State Cyrus Vance and his British count, count, counterpart, Lord Owen. This was the pattern that they suggested would be an appropriate partition plan for Bosnia uh, after the outbreak of conflict. And it was basically an old CIA public domain uh, ethnic distribution map that colored different provinces in a different color depending on whether they had a plurality of one of the three major groups, the Croats, the Serbs, and the, and the Bosnian Muslims. It was a crashing failure, if you recall that, 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 that far back. And it would have been easy to see why this might not be successful if this pattern had been thought about geographically a bit. Uh, there are various ways of doing this. One would be to actually look at the nature of the land that the Bosnian Muslims were getting, and it was almost all non-arable, non-productive land. So it's kind of analogy to thinking about the, the Iraq situation. I worked with an Austrian geographer at the time. We looked at another way of analyzing this, this, uh, this phenomenon. We took uh, data for how people moved around in Bosnia prior to the outbreak of conflict, primarily using these little minibuses and so forth. And we constructed micro and macro functional regions how people actually functioned in space before the outbreak of conflict. Then we superimposed that on the proposed partition map. You can see almost no correspondence between the two. Some kind of thinking along th those lines can, could well have led to uh, much, much more productive ways of proposing to deal with the conflict than the ones that actually uh, were, uh, were, were dominant in the, in the early stages of, of the conflict. And regrettably, conflict is not a thing of the past. We're likely to be uh, facing much more of this in the future. The importance then of approaching these kinds of issues from a geographical perspective becomes quite clear, I think, when you see it in the, in the, uh, against the backdrop of this kind of an example. All right, so let's now move on to the nature of 
places and, and regions. You know, I, I mentioned a few a few minutes ago. It's it's in a way odd. You know, we study all sorts of phenomena, but we rarely actually put them together in terms of the the more complex character of places and regions. And yet we use places and regions to organize our thinking about the world. And actually they're quite influential in how we construct our ideas about the world and the sorts of the, the ways that uh, everyday people and indeed policymakers approach the world. This next map has been a very powerful map in the way that many people have conceptualized the world over the last uh, 20 years. And it's quite a bad map in my, in my view. It's quite an unhelpful map in my view. But you only get at that if you actually do what any good geographer does when he or she looks at any pattern, which is to ask not just where the pattern is, but what, is, what does it represent? What's hidden and what's revealed when we map something in a particular way? This, of course, is a variant of the Samuel Huntington idea of clash of civilizations, and here's how the world is organized increasingly into competing blocks of Judeo-Christian world versus the Islamic world, and, and, and so forth. And that map has had a huge, has had enormous conceptual significance for the kinds of, uh, of policies that have come out of the United States, but other parts of, of the world as well. It's an unhelpful map in the sense that there's so much that lies within the green space that actually makes the green space not a terribly useful space for trying to understand what's going on in the world. You know, I, I, we could go on again about this at, at great length. But instead of looking at some of the ethno-territorial complexities that lie within this region, or some of the historic and contemporary conflicts that exist between political units and other uh, units within this region, the tendency still is to think about the Islamic world as a kind of unproblematized uh, geopolitical block uh, with all sorts of consequences for how we understand it and even the perpetuation of various kinds of stereotypes that are not very helpful in understanding what's going on in the world. I like to show this student, this map to some of, uh, this uh, photograph, excuse me, to some of my students uh, at, from time to time and I ask them where I am in this map. You can see I'm standing there in the middle. And, uh, and I say before you answer I want to tell you that the woman here uh, uh, is the chairman of the geography department at the, it, and I'm standing in front of the geography building at a major university in a major country. And, well, there's occasionally someone who figures it out, but uh, I'm standing actually in front of the geography building at the University of Isfahan in Iran a, a few years ago. And there's usually a, a little bit of shock that runs through some people's ID, uh, brains when, when, when they hear that. Because They've heard so much about women in the Islamic world. The idea that a woman would be the chairman of a geography department at a major university that doesn't fit with their worldview. But of course, the role of women in Iraq, in Iran, is very different from the role of women in Saudi Arabia. And understanding those differences is surely key if we're going to understand uh, a, a part of the world that is, is clearly on all of our minds these days. Well, countries themselves are another kind of region, if you will, or another kind of place. And the importance of thinking carefully about spaces and places and the nature of countries themselves is quite clear when you think about how many border conflicts there are between different countries around, around the world. In fact, there's so many of these, that there are whole units such as the, at the University of Durham, the International Boundaries uh, Research Unit, that um, has... Uh, that spend time trying to compile all the different claims and counterclaims and produce maps and so forth to help us understand what's going on with these, with, with these conflicts. Um, and uh, of course, a lot of the attention is on the particular claims that are made and the counterclaims that are made. And you can develop long lists of these, but these are always embedded in larger understandings and larger ideas about how we should organize ourselves in space what political territorial units represent, what they, what, they, uh, what they are properly meant to be as political territorial units. I've used the term in some of my own work of this concept of regimes of territorial legitimation to get at this idea. Not just focusing on what the particular claims are, but how 
particular states over time sustain ideas about what constitutes their territories. The institutions and practices and discourses that tend to promote this idea that this is rightfully our, our space, our, our territory. And there was a really interesting book taking not this particular concept, but, uh, but I think of employing this idea that was writ written by a University of Wisconsin historian uh, by the name of Wendy Chakul on the development of Thailand over, over time, where he's really looking at how it came to be normalized that a particular chunk of the Earth's surface with those boundaries should be one country. There's nothing natural in it or inevitable about this. This is not a primordial unit. It's something that develops over time, as all countries do, out of a, a growing sense of this is rightfully our territory. And those regimes of territorial legitimation need to be understood if we're going to actually understand the complexity of some of the conflicts that are unfolding uh, over, over boundaries, both on land and, of course, as many people are thinking about in this part of the world, uh, in, uh, in the maritime uh, arena as well. With so many conflicts taking place uh, now in the South China Sea, and of course, most immediately of relevance to Japan, uh, in, in the East China Sea, with the Senkaku or da Daoyu uh, 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 conflict. These are conflicts that are, you can understand the different points that the, each side makes. You know, China says, well, we were there back in the 14th century, and we've been fishing there, and we were using this for navigational purposes. And Japan says, well, we shows up, we show, we're there at, at the end of the 19th century, and we're, we were uncontested, and what well, you can go, you, you, you can go through, through these various uh, 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 scenarios. But to really understand what's at stake and how difficult it can be to resolve these, you need to look at them, I would argue, against a backdrop of a larger understanding of the way each side normalizes their view of what constitutes our proper territory. It's actually a, 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 an issue then that brings in both the foundational ideas of how a state came into being in the first place. You know, this, this, the idea that this is a state representing a certain people in some cases, or this is a state, in other cases, that simply emerged because it was created from the outside, but we have to live with that jurisdiction, like a lot of the African states and, and, and so forth. And then, of course, it's affected by changing political currents within the country. So uh, my brother is sitting in the audience here and gave a talk uh, gave a talk to this group, I think, or not, not too long ago, Tag Murphy, um, has written a book, Japan and the Shackles of the Past, where he actually goes into the China-Japan uh, controversy over these islands in some detail. And what we grew up in the same household, so I guess we had some of the same influences uh, early on thinking about things. But I read that section of Tag's book, and it really sounded a lot like the way I try to lecture to my classes about this, because he's not, he, did, he spends very little time on the specifics of this claim versus that claim, but much more on how particular political developments in China and Japan now frame the way that the, the conflict is, uh, is understood and presented. Everything from, in the Chinese case, a shift in the way that the regime in Beijing uh, is presenting its legitimacy, uh, shifting away much more from a kind of Marxist-Leninist post-Civil War mentality to we provide the economic, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we're the basis for the economic juggernaut that has, has uh, uh, underlain uh, uh, China's uh, leap forward in, in recent times. And of course, the shift in Japan that has occurred with changing political administrations and so forth. Again, I, I can't get into the details here, but that kind of way of, of thinking about things ultimately comes not just from taking these spaces on the map for granted, and memorizing their locations, but actually thinking about what they are and what they mean, which is the same way that a geographer thinks about just about any, any pattern that you might map. If you put a pattern of population distribution up, you immediately start thinking about, well, why do all those people live in eastern China but not so many live in western China? Somehow when we put a political map up, our brains go dead. We stop thinking in interesting geographical ways about it, and they're just spaces to be memorized. And then, oh, okay, there's some, there, there's some overlaps uh, that, that have to be dealt with. All right. So the human environment interactions uh, uh, piece of, of all this, the part of the looking at the, pla at the planet, not in terms of individual phenomena, but in terms of the relationships among phenomena, 
in place. And we can stay here, I think, with the maritime conflict theme for just a second to show the importance, actually, for key issue of the 21st century um, uh, when you think geographically about human environment I interactions. Because one of the things that's going on right now, of course, is that we are in a period of fairly significant and fairly clearly easy to document climate change. And that climate change has a pretty significant impact for the very way that we divide up jurisdiction over the, uh, the oceans of the world. So the way we divide up jurisdiction of the oceans of the world, of course, is to, develop, to, to measure territorial waters and exclusive economic zones out from the baselines of countries. And what are the baselines of countries? Areas that lie above the, uh, the water at high tide levels. And so you get actually a significant chunk of the planet now that is, that is either in an exclusive economic zone or a territorial water as a consequence of this way of, uh, of measuring the, the, uh, the, the control. And there's all sorts of little controversies about, well, is it really high tide or not so high a tide, and how big is the bay, and all things that I could bore you with for, for hours. But one of the really interesting questions that almost no one is looking at right now, but surely is going to be important going forward, is that we are in a period of uh, quite significant, of course, um, uh, sea level rise. Sea level rise will change the baselines. It is already changing the baselines of, of, of key places. There are, there are small islands in archipelagic states, uh, Kiribati and so forth, that, that, are, are, that used to be above water and are now below water. This has consequences not just for a speck of land that disappears. It has consequences for that larger pattern that I was drawing out around before. Thinking geographically about these kinds of problems makes us realize that if we start looking towards something like a meter or a meter and a half rise in sea level, we're going to be looking at something quite dramatic in terms of the shifting coastlines of places. Now, it won't be this dramatic because, of course, there's all sorts of interventions that, that are happening uh, to try to uh, maintain the shorelines that are there. I, uh, the Dutch engineers are in, in high demand around the world these days. Um, and, uh, well, Japan no, is no stranger to this. I mean, even small specks of land like Okino Torishima uh, have built, have had huge investments to build up uh, these concrete structures to try to maintain the land so that Japan can continue to claim an exclusive economic zone uh, around it. But all this has profound consequences potentially for uh, the actual areas of extension of control over, the, over maritime areas, and indeed for many of the conflicts that are out there right now. Some anticipation of where these issues may be playing out in particularly sensitive areas might help us head off some of the issues that we may be facing uh, going forward. And just to use one other example in this, in this realm for this part of the world, we of course have a, rap, a radical alteration of natural systems going on, not just climate systems. But something like the damming of the Mekong, each of the red dot, docks, docks is an operational dam, is of course dramatically changing the nature of the Mekong ecosystem. And our tendency still, because the Mekong flows through several different countries, is to look at this on a country by country basis. But that's hardly adequate anymore to try to understand actually what's going on with, what, with uh, the transformation of the, Me of the Mekong system. What's needed is actually to bring together, and it's hard to do, countries control a great deal of the flow of information and data about what's going on. We need to bring together information in new spatial frameworks in order to understand actually the challenges that, uh, that a place like the Mekong is facing. Well, thinking geographic, geographically about uh, uh, places on, and, and human interactions also can encourage consideration of connections between different things that sometimes we don't pay as much attention to as we might. So there's a lot of, of emphasis now on building houses and even developments that are environmentally uh, uh, sustainable or at least more sustainable. For, uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, trying to use alternative energy and, and better insulation and so forth. And that's all for the good in many ways. But unless you're actually thinking not just about what an individual structure looks like, but how a particular development is situated in relationship to its surroundings, 
you can miss some fundamentally important things that have environmental impacts. Uh, one of my favorite examples is this development right outside of DC, which was uh, touting its environmental sustainability. But of course, it's a gated community. And if you happen to live in this house here, and you want to go shopping, there's a shop uh, store about right here. Your only alternative to go shopping is to get in your car, drive over here, drive out here, drive all the way out to the street, and come all the way around to go 50 yards to go shopping. <laughs> These things actually have environmental consequences as well. But unless we're thinking about the context of developments in a, in a geographically sensitive way, we're unlikely to get at this. And to take this, uh, this whole way of thinking up a scale, I've g given a series of lectures in mainland China over the last few months because I've been living in Hong Kong. And uh, I often show this picture, and I watch the Chinese, many, many of my Chinese students uh, start, the, you can see them, the, the gear is starting to flow in their minds. Which Chinese city is this? Well, it's Doha in Qatar, so it's not in China at all. But of course, the reason that the gears start moving in that direction is actually what we, the, the very notion of what constitutes a modern, progressive, forward-looking city has become placeless in a certain way. It's the same kind of landscape that we reproduce from one part of the planet to the other because that's the landscape that represents modernity and that's the landscape that represents uh, uh, pro pro progress. And what it means is, as uh, a title of an interesting article on Doha suggests, that the paradigm is to build glass refrigerators in the desert. <laughs> and Doha went in for this in a big way, with almost no sensitivity to the actual physical environmental con context within which this city was, was located. You can see all sorts of examples of this in other ways as, as well. I, I like to use examples of <coughs> suburbs around Phoenix, Arizona, which are developed perfectly adapted to the New England climate of the United States, all driven by this idea of how we should live with an individual house with a large lawn that is green most of the time around us. That has big, enormous consequences for the, the, uh, the, for the environment, of course, as well as the people who live there. Well, finally, Doha, developing this model, ultimately starts raising some concerns because Doha is a city now with the highest per capita energy and water consumption of any city on the planet. So, of course, there's a lot of concern that gets developed around this, but how is it dealt with? Well, Doha de develops a campaign to make Doha green. One of the things they do is they plant a lot of trees along the highways going in from the airport into Doha keep each one of these trees alive, takes an enormous amount of water produced in a water desalinization plant, which is enormously energy consumptive to make Doha green. I mean, it's, it, well, I, the point is so obvious, I don't, I, I, I don't have to make it. <clears throat> well, finally, because I know we're, we're short on time, um, to me, one of the most fundamental ways of thinking geographically is to ask a question of how where something happens affects what happens. So much of what happens in this, uh, the ways we look at the world in the social sciences are driven by modes of analysis that uh, treat differences from place to place as the noise in the model. You know, we're looking for the similarities across places. But there are, another way of looking at things is to actually ask, start from a different point of entry, to ask, how does the particular context of some development shape what happens? And this, there's actually a growing interest in that, that kind of mode of analysis. When we're looking at something like urban sprawl, just to stay with the urban theme. Urban sprawl immediately connotes bad, something environmentally bad in most people's minds. Actually, the consequences of urban sprawl are quite different from place to place, depending on the structure of the cities and whether, in fact, you have a, ser a series of little commercial centers where um, urban sprawl can actually lead to less long distance movement as opposed to a city where everybody's coming into the center and having to travel uh, uh, great, great distances. We're told sometimes that the world is flat, but any real 
geographically sensitive way of looking at the world is to suggest that it's not very flat for many people or, around, around the world. And understanding that flatness, is you know, the lack of flatness, is to actually recognize that places really are different. I think this is an enormously revealing map. It's a map of travel time to major cities. There's also shipping lanes on here, but just travel time to, to major cities. And where you are on this map has a huge impact, actually, on your life and your set of possibilities and your connections uh, with, the, with the wider world around you. And a sensitivity to those kinds of concerns is leading now to all sorts of interesting studies. For example, of uh, instead of just taking something like uh, agricultural commercialization in India, which has had a huge impact on the way it, uh, ag agriculture has been, is conducted, in India, the modernization, monocropping of uh, large monocropping, and so forth. Well, that's that's interesting, but the consequences of monocropping are very different from one part of India to another. And what this it was a study that was actually trying to look at vulnerability to climate change in the same places where agricultural commercial commercial agriculture has taken root to show us something about areas that may actually be particularly vulnerable in the face of a, a, a changing uh, global environmental circumstance. So, I hope in these, this panoply of examples I've given you, I've given you some idea of why thinking geographically about the world is important for, for addressing some of the key environmental, social, political challenges that we're, we're facing around the world. And it's a way of, of approaching these that goes far beyond can you put the Nile River in the right place on a map, or can you find Mexico in the right place on a map? In the United States, a place where geography was considerably marginalized in the curriculum over the course of the last two, two generations, there are some positive signs of, of more, a bit more concern with geography. The number of geography majors has been on the rise. The National Academy of Sciences has uh, starting to devote studies to the importance of geography for trying to understand key issues. Uh, places uh, that had geography at one point, then abandoned it, are starting to bring it back. Harvard, in this case, although in very limited form, in this case, it's really just a uh, sort of technical applications uh, uh, center. And um, uh, this study, which I had the, the opportunity to chair for the National Research Council of, of the United States, I think, uh, actually is particularly interesting in this regard because it sets a whole forth a whole array of ways in which geographical thinking can help us address some of the kinds of issues uh, that I've, I've uh, discussed tonight. And I, I think it is, is a good platform for trying to understand why we cannot afford to uh, continue to think of geography simply as an old-fashioned subject associated with place name memorization. Last thing I would note is perhaps the most significant uh, forward step in the United States we've taken is at the high school level in recent uh, years. About uh, a little over 10 years ago, an advanced placement program was launched in geography in North American high schools. It started with just about 3,000 students taking a high level course in high school, which was supposed to prepare them for college. It's actually the equivalent of an entry level course in college. And it has been the single fastest growing, larger, advanced placement <coughs> program that the College Board runs in the United States over the last 10 years. It's up to about 160,000 North American students now taking geography, which is pretty significant. Well, there we have it. I thank you very much for your uh, attention. And I'd be more than happy to entertain some comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you. One thing if you, if for geographers, if you have an old map of any island or sea in East Asia, auction it. <laughs> and the older it is, the more money you get for, yeah. for it. And uh, the, the second thing that was point made is very important is there's always a, a feeling in, in all our societies like Japan that the country has always existed. In other words, that it's the people say, well, look, Japanese who lived here 10,000 years ago, well, 10,000 years ago, they lived here, but it wasn't Japan, it was not the state. Uh, so I think that's a very important and part. And who's the Japanese? Right? Yes, the they, were, right? they, just, they, they were. Right. They, they were. In fact, the, the notion, if you'd ask most Japanese even 200 years ago, what is your country, they would have 
name the Han, the local locality, but then thought of Japan. This is not unique to Japan, the same, you can see the same thing in Europe. Um, so, questions? Um, I'd like to let Alec uh, take the questions because an academic is used to this. So, I promised him the most dynamic audience in town. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to use this? want to use that one for the audience. Yes. And then, then I'll use this one. Uh, so you can move around. <laughs> Which up. I went a bit over my time, so I apologize. Please. I think it's the drill is a step to the microphone there. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, it's always very interesting to hear more about uh, modern geography and, and political geography. <clears throat> Question of you mentioned that recently, particularly recently, the knowledge of geography has fallen off, and that the disparate thinking, as you said, has proliferated. How much do you think uh, may be due somewhat to the rapid expansion of GPS devices and Google Earth? Uh, Oh, used to be if I wanted to go from New York to Texas, I'd get the map and, right. and chart it. Now I just get into the car and tell the GPS to tell me where to turn. Yeah. How much do you think is due to technology or to right. many other fields? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's an excellent question, actually, one I've, I've given some thought to. So I, I guess I, I, I first have to say that, uh, um, unfortunately, the, the huge decline in geographic understanding predates a lot of this. GPS. I, I mean, it, it, I can really only speak with authority about the, the U.S. context. And in the U.S. context, all the way back to uh, the, the, the 20s and 30s in primary and secondary schools, a social studies movement started to take the place of the individual study of history and geography. And geography lost out in that process. And uh, then in the aftermath of World War II, when so much of the, so many of the, the uh, even the social sciences that were mimicking more of the sciences um, uh, were, became the more dominant ones. Geography sort of lost further ground there. So people could go through the U.S. educational system from kindergarten through college and never really have any significant exposure to geography. So in many senses, it was little. So it wasn't terribly surprising that people had little sense of how the, the world was was organized. That's, in a sense, a different scale issue from the one you've raised. Because the one you've raised is something quite, quite interesting. Right now, uh, of course, most of us get around by plugging the coordinates into a, a, a GPS or something and uh, either looking at the, at the very confined route map that you're provided or maybe listening to Siri or whatever her name is uh, you know, tell, tell, you, tell you where to go. And the consequence of that is, I think, directly what you're talking about. It actually tends to limit our thinking about the surrounding context. It's, it's, it's a bit analogous to that DC suburb where you don't think about the surrounding context. You simply think about the route. Imagine uh, uh, for a moment you, you emerge from a, uh, from a subway in a city you don't know, and you don't have a GPS, and you want to get somewhere. What's among the first things you do? at least I do, maybe some other people do, is, well, first thing, you want to get a sense of north, south, east, west. So you look at where the sun is. Nobody's doing that anymore. <laughs> um, you're, you're, looking, you're, you're getting a sense of the layout of the street, and maybe you have an old-fashioned map where you can see not just your route, but you can see, oh, well, there's a hill over there, or uh, if, if, it's a, if it's a topographic map, or I can see the layout of this major boulevard surrounded by some of these other things. All of that's pushed to the side now. And so we have this rather tunnel vision that goes along with the use of these kinds of devices. So I actually worry about that. In one sense, maps are more ubiquitous now than they used to be because it's so much easier to produce. You know, anybody with a, a simple GIS program can actually do some things to, that, that would have been 
very difficult a generation ago. Mylar and rapidographs and you know and all, all sorts of things. Uh, and yet the GPS technology really encourages a kind of tunnel vision. So I actually would argue that's another reason why we ought to be actively thinking about and teaching geography. To counteract in some sense is one of the negative consequences of that, even though I've used GPS to get myself from place A to place B on, on, on quite a few occasions, and it can be quite helpful. Yes? Sorry, I have to use the microphone. So <laughs> <you know. laughs> Hello, my name is Evan Sankey. Um, I'm not actually a Temple University student, but just visiting. Um, you mentioned in um, one of your earlier slides the, the example of Iraq, the decision to go to war not being informed by good geography. And I'm wondering if uh, you could talk a little bit more about that. I know that historians complain a lot that politicians misuse history right, uh, all the time. I'm wondering if you could talk about how politicians misuse geography. Right. Yeah, sure. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, for the question. Um, I was on a, a, a fairly politically active campus at the time that the U.S. made the decision to go into Iraq. There were large student <laughs> gatherings. Uh, I was invited to speak at a couple of them. One was initially whether we should go in. But then once, actually on the eve of the invasion, or maybe it was even a couple of days into the invasion, they had another forum saying, okay, the U.S. has gone into Iraq, what should we be thinking about? What, what should be on, sort of at the top of the agenda? And I actually have done a lot more research in Europe than the Middle East, but I uh, knew something about that part of the world. So I, uh, I put together a little presentation that actually I, I retrospect wish I had published because uh, it was a little bit of a guide uh, guide not because I was particularly insightful but simply because I was thinking about the world in a slightly different way I think from the way that the, the, the dominant uh, crafters of the policy were thinking about it that um, I, I, I was was clearly um, significant if we were to head off some of the problems that were there so what was I thinking about well, one of the things I was thinking about was, of course, the underplaying of the, the divisions, the ethnocultural divisions w w within Iraq. And um, to know even a little bit about the history and geography of Iraq is to realize that you know, this country didn't exist 100 years previously, that it was uh, you know, a product of the British basically knitting together three different provinces within the, the Ottoman Empire, mostly so that it would be easier to get the oil out to the Persian Gulf from the, nor the northern part of Iraq. So there was a weak, fairly weakly developed sense of national unity within this country, but that national unity did exist to some degree, and its principal focus was a kind of anti-outsider in, outside interference kind of nationalism, which was a function of, of the way of, of the British period. So I was thinking, well, first of all, if, if that's the, the sort of history and geography of the country, one of the most important things, first of all, would be to try to preserve whatever institutions uh, are ones that can help sustain that sense of national unity and something in the face of something that I didn't think was a good idea to start with because it played right into, but that, 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 that's another issue. And so, of course, what happened because we weren't thinking that way, the Iraqi army was disbanded almost right away, which was a profoundly bad decision, actually, that everybody kind of recognizes as, as, as a bad decision. The second thing I was thinking about was that, was this issue that I just sketched a little bit here, is that the, the sense of buy-in of the major ethnocultural groups, if you want to try to create some kind of stable country, can so easily be undermined if there's not some system put into place early on that makes it clear that one group's not going to be the dominant one throwing its, um, you know, its, its interests around at, at the expense of the, uh, of the others. So this issue of the relationship between oil and 
and, and, the, uh, and, and the, um, the ethnic patterns, you saw almost no attention to this for three years. It was not until 2006 that that started getting any attention. To say nothing about the importance of constructing a, a pluralist regime in Baghdad that uh, could be seen as representative of the different inter interests in, in the country. Third thing I was thinking about at the time was that it was, it was so easy in, a, in Iraq that already had fairly porous boundaries that in Iraq that had descended into a certain amount of chaos for it to be a place where um, disaffected others could go and, um, and of course that's exactly what happened. I mean, you know, Al-Qaeda Al started to build up in Iraq because they were flowing into Iraq. Our military strategy in Iraq was to build big bases and control a few key central places. I remember thinking, well, if, if, I don't think this is a good idea to start with, but if I had military resources to deploy, I would be concerned much more about securing some of the key borders and much less about building a huge set of two large military bases and diplomatic compound that could feed into this whole notion of, uh, well, here's another occupying power taking the position of the British. Um, I think I, I also had some issues about uh, the relationship with the neighbors. I, I, one of the things that most stunned me, and here's a, maybe a good way in my response to your, your question, one of the things that most stunned me about the official rhetoric about Iraq uh, in the aftermath of the invasion was the comparison that was made between the Iraq of, let's say, 2004 and Japan and Germany right after World War II. I mean, this, it, it, there's all sorts of analogies. Well, uh, senior men members of the Bush administration said, well, of course, things aren't, you know, things aren't so smooth, but, you know, it just takes a while. Think of Japan and Germany after World War II. Now, to use Japan or Germany as an analog for Iraq is a stunning example of an inability to actually think at all about uh, historical or geographical differences between places. I mean, uh, J Japan and, and Germany, the, the, uh, well, the, the ethnic picture is, 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 is an obvious one. In the, in the case of uh, the American presence in Japan and Germany, how was that viewed by surrounding powers as opposed to the American presence in Iraq? I mean, you can go on and on. This was, these, are, these are analogies that are so bad that you, you think, how can you get away with that kind of an analogy? How can, you, how, how can that be sustained? It would be as if you know, the administration got up and said, well, um, you know, I, I, you know, what would be a good, a good analogy? You know, this, this, uh, you know, what, what happened here was, uh, was like what happened when um, the Germans moved in and took over Russia in 1917. Wait, the Germans didn't move in to take over Russia. There was a Russian Revolution in 1917. You can't get away with the latter because at least enough people know enough history to think that's an absurd uh, analogy. But somehow you can get away with Japan and Germany are analogs for Iraq. It's stunning. and very eye-opening to some of us who frankly know nothing about uh, geographic analysis. Um, what kind of frameworks does your field of study provide for considering what many of us uh, look at as sort of a worrisome, you know, aggressive expansionist posture of, of China recently? That's especially uh, true of Japan. I mean, one could say on the one hand you would look at at geographic constraints and maybe China just sort of trying to protect its own turf, <coughs> or you could, uh, a Samuel Huntington kind of person might say that, you know, Chinese are looking for more cultural affinities with, with people in the surrounding areas and, and they've got a huge population and, and expansion uh, has to take place, otherwise they'll sort of implode. So, I mean, I'd like to understand the geographic framework yeah. for maybe analyzing yeah. um, China. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. Such right. Such an open-ended question. I right. No. That, that's, that, that, but 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 uh, a, a really interesting one. I mean, I would say the 
The short answer would be to actually disparage some of the, the Huntingtonian ideas, but um, to, to recognize the, 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 some of the, the, um, the realities of, of how uh, you know, China is approaching um, everything from its eastern, sorry, its western borders to, to its uh, claims in the South China Sea. So, I mean, well, first of all, I don't know if geography has any particular uh, extra special, you know, sense of China in, in particular as opposed to, to many others. And some of these complicated pro problems we need people with as many different uh, uh, ways of, of approaching things and understanding things uh, as, as possible. But I, I mean, to, to my view, um, in, in, at least in, in my limited, and I'm not an expert on this part of the world, I spent a lot of my, my career working in, in Europe, but to my, to my limited understanding, the idea of uh, you know, China is going to march in and take over half the planet um, doesn't have any real resonance with what I would see as China's regime of territorial uh, uh, legitimacy. Uh, uh, legitimacy. It's, it's a, it, it's, uh, there's little in the historical or contemporary record to suggest that China is you know, looking to take over territories that it never had any association with. On the other hand, um, so, so I don't worry about you know, China slowing, showing up in Slovakia. Oh, well, <laughs> Chinese uh, e economic interests, maybe. But, uh, but um, at, at, at the same time, what, if one looks at uh, you know, the, the way that the, the regime in Beijing um, has, is sort of constituting its present legitimacy, I mean, it's very much rooted in not just the economic juggernaut, which I referred to in my talk, but it's also very much rooted in the putting China in a position that it will no longer have to suffer the kinds of humiliations that were associated with the century of humiliation. And the way that that sense of legitimacy is advanced is, and you can sort of see it in terms of the, some of the specific, actually even maps that are produced in Beijing by the foreign policy establishment, is, um, is, is to emphasize that that means that China, where China has had a historical presence, that's where we're going to draw the line. That's where it's going to be. That's that's going to be our territory. That's where we're going to uh, we're going to, going to be uncompromising. And of course, it's those differences about where <laughs> what what actually constitutes China's presence that um, that, that are are you know the, the subject of, of all sorts of sorts of controversies. But I, so if you're worried about China's, you know, where China's is going to extend itself militarily, I would say your best mode of thinking about that is to look historically at the largest expansion in any direction that China has had. Those are the areas to worry about, not Slovakia. I'm thinking about Slovakia tonight for, 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 for fun. Because I think that's, that's the, you know, that's the essence of, of, of what's going on. And of course, then, uh, I mean, uh, well, maybe I've said enough. Yeah. Says so, now we'll have the representative from Prague. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not not Slovakia, but Czechia. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Um, I have a provocative question. Please. I'm a historian. Yeah. And um, what I've understood is that you do political geography yes. as a major. Yeah. But in your explanations, yes, the word geography doesn't come out as often as history. Uh huh. So I was thinking, if you know, as an academic to an academic, yep. and there's this war now these days between which department holds which department. Where is it exactly that political geography right. offers something more than history? Right. Because I feel what you were presenting to me is, oh, if I know the history of the place, if I know the place, yeah. I know pretty much what you're going to tell me. Right. So where is it that you challenge so if you make it a discipline versus a discipline, so yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, great. Sorry. No, no, that's a great question. That's a great. Question. So first of all, um, uh, despite the fact that I wanted to highlight geography tonight, I have I, I have little, relatively little interest in disciplinary turf wars, uh, and in fact, I usually find these kind of unproductive. Um, so uh, I, I'm 
really not terribly concerned with what you call it, as, as long as important questions are being asked and, and uh, analyses are, are being done. So that's, that's point one. Point two is that, to me, history and geography are kind of two sides of, of, of a coin. I, I actually, and not all geographers are as historically oriented as I am. I, I'm, very, I, I'm very historically oriented. To me, to explain the present, you have to understand how it, how it, how it developed over time. And so I, one casual answer would be, well, uh, geographers are a bit more focused on the present, political geographers. A lot, I mean, something like looking at maritime boundaries and how they might change in relationship to changing sea level. I don't see that coming out of the historical, you know, out of my colleagues over over in history. So, um, so there's a, it's a bit of a of a different emphasis. But to me, there's no good history without geography, and there's no good geography with, without history. So why? So you might say, well, I was okay. interested in your methods. Right. So so, I don't know what, what methods we would use. I was curious right. about the methods you would use. Yeah. yeah. So well. So my my particular methods have a lot of overlap with history because I may I you know and, and I I'm not embarrassed at all to, to say that although some of the more spatial analytic methods are less common in history although there's a prominent uh, Asian historian at Harvard Peter Bold who just won the Association of American Geographers Honorary Geography Award because he's developed a very sophisticated historical GIS of China and so we call it history we call it geography I don't care. It's really interesting. It's, it, it's really useful. But you might say, so what you say you don't care, but you got up and harangued us for 35, 40 minutes about geography. And why did you do that if you don't care? And the reason I did that is that for all the fact that I, uh, I don't think uh, we should worry too much about labels. I do worry when certain ways of thinking, certain ways of analysis, modes of analysis, certain kinds of questioning aren't part of the mix. And when I get the question about you know, Iraq, um, to me, it's a profoundly good example of where a whole way of thinking that I associate with geography uh, was not part of the mix. And methodologically, that ranges from something that's very close to history to something that's a bit more sort of spatial analytic in the way that I was talking about. It. And maybe something, there's a, there's a subset of history, environmental history, that gets, that I think is quite close to some of the human environment stuff, but that's a fairly small bit of the historical discipline. It's much more central in geography. So I worry about when we just sort of say, well, we don't need geography, because then a lot of those things don't get asked that should be asked. A lot of the ways of, of an, an analyzing aren't there. But I don't worry about whether a historian's doing it or a geographer's doing it, because it just is all to the good if it's being done. Yes. Okay, my name is Clyde Uno, I'm Japanese. And you show a slide of Iranian universities to some. Yeah, it's the University of right? Iran. Yeah. And currently, Iran have a heavy sanction by the United States, right? Yes. Yeah. So do you have some special intention for showing this slide? And do you have some <laughs> geography, you know, relationship or connection do you have? Uh, there is an office of the geographer in the State Department. I've spoken to them on a number of occasions. I don't know how much they listen to me. I don't think a whole lot. Uh, uh, they did actually, that Bosnian study I showed you, that I did a major presentation of that in Washington, D.C. And that guy got a lot of attention, actually. But it was after the fact. You know, we did that analysis uh, uh, after the fact. But, the Office of the Geographer has grown actually to do more of that kind, uh, that, that kind, kind of analysis. But uh, you know, the reality is, you know, I work in a university. I, I, try to, I, I try to write things and try to speak uh, in ways that will uh, have some potential impact, but I don't have any, any direct line. And uh, I just don't know the extent to which uh, the kinds of well, stereotypes that I'm trying to uh, I'm, I'm trying to attack are are are, are well understood. Uh, it, mm, maybe I'll qualify that a bit. There are actually quite a few geographers who work in Washington D.C. Former students of mine work in both the State Department and the CIA, uh, and the latter ones they can't tell me what they do with unless they really <laughs> tell me. No, no. Uh, but uh, so there are geographers there. The question is, do they get listened to? Um, or, and 
you know, they're good geographers and bad geographers, just like they're good historians and bad historians, and, you know, and, and so forth. But I, I, I do know that uh, in the lead up to the US invasion of Iraq, there were quite a few people in the intelligence community and in the, in the State Department that were uh, raising red flags, that were actually pointing to things that did not fit with the dominant story. And they were basically pushed aside. There's been a lot written about this now, and, that, and that's, that's quite clear. So just because you're making a point doesn't necessarily mean it gets, it gets listened to. Yeah. Okay, thank you. My question, apparently, in a stupid one. Oh, I, I, uh, no, I can't, I can't oh, imagine that simply. Do you know Kabul? Kabul? Kabul. Kabul. Kurtball, yes, yes, okay, thank yes. You. My question is, how will the Americans know the Kabul? Kabul. Because you asked me to say the talking of the 2003 Iraq. Yeah. So, it reminds me of the, the Mr. Colin Powell's uh, conflict. He was stupid. Ah, mm -hmm. right. The reason is related with the, the geography. Because uh, I need to spend uh, five minutes to explain uh, our prime minister, Abe, Abe, he calls himself. <laughs> in, in the United States, he did. Yeah, yeah. I he call him Abe, my yes, name is right yeah. <laughs> He is now trying to change the Japan's uh, geographically or politically very much. Yeah. And his uh, theory, his politics is based on the, in Japanese, chikyuri gaiko. Chikyuri means uh, growth. Gaiko means development. Mr. Habe is doing that based on his chikyuri gaiko and failing Many, uh, many places in China, Korea, and in uh, Jerusalem. So, I bet when the you uh, Mr. Bush uh, uh, invaded uh, Baghdad, Mr. Abe was the general secretary of the LDP. So he is the one who knows the tragedy at that time. But nobody in Japan knows. Uh, so I just wonder, please tell the Japanese how well the Kabul is known among the American citizens. But, but, but I'm, I'm, still, I'm a little confused about what you, I was just using curveball mm -hmm. as an expression. A curveball is something that's not straightforward, but, right. but it, it is, uh, well, I'm not a baseball player, oh, but it's the Giants. Oh, uh, the pitcher you, throws you know, a curveball. Does anybody know <laughs> Kabul? Well, it's a the Iraqian. Hmm? The Iraqian. Yeah, Kurtball uh, was the. Yes. <coughs> he was the informant. He, the Iraqian. Iraqi American. Iraqi American. Oh. His code name was Kurtball. Oh, he, he I, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. So this is this is a yeah, mass, disconnect mass, here. Mass yeah. destruction weapon. Yeah. It was false. I see what you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It is called Kurtball. Okay. And I thought... I'm glad I came tonight so I could learn I see, this. I thought many <laughs> Americans know that. Yeah, well... Including I'm, you. Well, I, 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 know, I know what you're talking about. I just didn't, I, I just didn't use that, that particular term. Mm -hmm. Right. But, I, I mean, it feeds actually into the answer a little bit to the, the prior question. Yes, because I was using curveball not with reference to that. Did you but I was using it as an expression uh, mm -hmm. uh, to... Reflect something that wasn't straightforward, but it's something that uh, was a, a little bit illusory. Uh, because, you know, a curveball in baseball, oh, I you, know, know, you don't quite know where it's coming. I it's think. An, uh, what do you call the fake name yeah. of the Iraqi American who <laughs> created this um, famous poor story? Right, right. And right, who right. Uh, Mr. Paul, uh, so, so, but, so, I mean, all I can really say about that is that, um, uh, is that, uh, it feeds in, into the, the the response I gave to the to the prior question because there were various stories being told at, at, at the time. Some of them proved up, proved to be much more accurate than others. But of course, it's not just a question of what stories are accurate; it's which ones get listened to, and that's I mean that's really the key. Or or what kind of critical judgment is brought to bear on which stories? And I know. 
I, 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 I know for a fact that there were many counter stories to the curveball story so uh, that were advanced I wish at the time. Tell our prime minister it's not great to follow the, uh, the Ameri uh, Ameri I'll, Ameri I'll Ameri take that message back, back home with me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm, um, I appreciate being able to come along because this kind of a talk really inspires us to think differently. But I like the way things were pulling together, and you've summarized it a couple of times towards the end of your answers, uh, in that if we look at, uh, there are two things I'll try to say. One, this fragile jewel hurtling through space, and we share the space on that little planet. And we really need to be thinking holistically. And are we adequately doing that? And it's not just environmental destruction and global warming and so on, but all of the human conflicts that take place yeah. on that jewel in space. And that leads me to the other side, which is, and I think you've been going there a couple of times. Um, I'm trained in politics, and I always teach politics with a historical basis. Otherwise, we don't understand what the hell's going on. But the policymakers who get us in or out, mostly in to the troubles, um, have not gotten there through an interdisciplinary, careful, and objective analysis of all of the factors. One major one is everything you've talked about geographical tonight. Where are the people? How do they get from here to there? Where is the oil? Where is the water? All of those things that are crucial in whether or not something can be done effectively, or is it doomed from the outset and maybe even counterproductive? Right. We're living with an ISIS now as an outgrowth of yep. some of the things you've just right. described. Yep. And we're, we're not through the woods at all on that. Um, and so in terms of uh, someone trained in the politics, uh, the science of politics was say, uh, a call for a much more uh, interdisciplinary and open policy making um, mechanism that would incorporate. So it's not really a question, but yeah. I, I no, wanted to try to pull those things. But that's a great observation. I think that's a great observation. I, I completely agree, I, I agree with, with it. Uh, it's sometimes said that the the most influential photograph of the 20th century was the Bill Anders photograph on Apollo 8 when Apollo rounded the moon and the Earth was rising. And the Earth rise photo is, was, is one I'm sure that we all have in, in our minds. Um, and of course, it was so influential because, uh, as I mentioned earlier in my lecture, it actually was a kind of visualization that helped us understand something, helped us look at something in a sli slightly different way. And um, those kinds of visualizations can be extremely powerful in various ways at, at various different, different scales. And I think one of the things actually that drew me to geography originally was just, I loved looking at those kinds of things. I loved looking at maps and telling, and because they, they they forced you out of the individual compartments. So um, it's, it, it's a, uh, it, if I have a passion about geography beyond, well, it's, uh, it's, it's something that can inform policy making and so forth, which I, I think it can, and I agree, in the kind of interdisciplinary context that you describe, is that I also think it, it's such a valuable educational tool to get us to think a little bit differently about the world, to get us to think a little bit more holistically about the world, to get us to think about the kinds of connections that are really so key to everything from uh, the way we live our daily lives to the kinds of environmental and social and political issues that we're talking about. I meant to add also a focus in a conflict resolution and, and peace building on that uh, little jewel in space. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So going forward, not just right the mistakes of the past. Right. right. Yes, please. Okay, my name is Akira Takagi, and I'm a British agent of the Snippers. I know a little bit of the geopolitics because I don't know anything about geography. Uh, 
but you made the presentation about Bosnia, uh, and it's very much interesting because of the Islamist feelings that after disappeared boundaries, those Islamists or ethnic uh, moving uh, that can move uh, that 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 kind of boundaries. That, that I'm very much worried about what kind of presentation you did. You know that, that my concern is the recent terrorism for Islamists and the relations with such kind of Bosnia has uh, also the, you know, the Serbia and Croatia. And this kind of, uh, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the access, I mean, that's, you should be, uh, used to be a contain this area, but now no. And the reason, you know, that uh, a lot of terrorism in the Islamist activity in the world, you know, kind of relations so could you explain a little bit what kind of presentation you did? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess, um, first of all, I would say the, uh, the, the Bosnian Muslim uh, experience is quite different from, uh, I think, many of the issues that we're seeing today unfolding in, in Southwest Asia. If, uh, Bosnian Muslims uh, in, in, in Bosnia were a, a, a very, a pretty, fairly secularized, very sort of moderate uh, 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 Muslim community, uh, and it was not actually, actually they were really the victims uh, of what was what was going on there. They were sort of caught in the middle. I mean, Bosnia was the old. Uh, it was actually the old uh, frontier between the Ottoman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian uh, em Empire, and uh, they. They, um, the, the, the fundamental dynamic there was one of uh, Croatian and Serbian nationalism, and with Bosnian Muslims being sort of caught in, in, in the middle of, of, of the circumstances. So I think it's, not, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to make any kind of useful analogs uh, between those, those two circumstances. But, you know, part of your question, of course, relates to you know, how we try to understand spaces of terrorism and the sort of uh, spatial and geographical uh, characteristics of, of, of terrorism. Of course, this is a brand, you know, it's a new area. We're all struggling to, to try to try to figure some, some of these things out. But um, uh, the, the, the tendency, because it is so new and because the challenges that are there are the ones to the old, to the state pattern. To think of this as something very new, very novel, that is, is, is going on. And it is new and novel in some ways, but it's not new and novel in, in other ways. It's not new and novel in one sense, it's, it, it's, it's very much a territorial struggle. It's not a, it's not a postmodern you know, network struggle, it's a struggle about who's going to control actual spaces. And it feeds, uh, it directly feeds off of the breakdown in, uh, in, in governance and control over traditional uh, territorial, ter territorial spaces. And actually even to try to understand, in the case of like, like ISIS, of, you know, what it means and what its future is, is not just to look again at the individual characteristics of ISIS and its particular strategies, but actually to look at the surrounding uh, set, set of circumstances that uh, from, from Turkey, from from uh, you know Western Syria, from Lebanon, from from uh, uh, Iran, um, the in, in you know many senses there is plenty of military might in that part of the world that is stronger than ISIS, but everybody's waiting for somebody else to deal with the problem. <laughs> Yeah, in a sense, and it's that again more contextual view I think which helps us understand uh, uh, you know what, what's going on. There are doesn't mean there aren't novel things going, uh, uh, novel tactics that, that are, are involved. And actually, one of the interesting things about these new political and social movements, even, is the extent to which new technologies are now being harnessed, uh, including geographic technologies, actually to advance. Uh, the, the, the the cause. I mean, there's all there's all discussion about during the Arab Spring of how uh, social media was used to help bring together people and galvanize uh, uh, movements. And there's I, I've got a couple of friends actually in the geographic community in the United States who are actually trying to develop uh, 
a series, a time series of maps to show how this, how the spread of what was going on um, uh, was influenced by access to, to, to certain technologies and how that in turn uh, shaped the, uh, the development of the, the movements that happened. That kind of analysis is pretty interesting, but it's also very much in its infancy. There's only time for one last question. I'm going to ask it because I control the microphone. Je vous en prie. And this is marketing. Here's a question. You, you've traveled a lot. I think you've been a visiting fellow or a scholar outside of the US. Are there different national schools of geography? And how do they differ? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that, that, yeah, it's a great question. Yes, there are definitely different national schools of geography. I would say, in terms of the development of the discipline, uh, two of the, er, well, the, 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 there were some fundamental differences between the French and the German approach to geography in the late 19th and early 20th centuries that in some ways is still with us today. So the French geographers, uh, influenced by people like Vidal de la Blanche, were very much uh, together with the historians. They, uh, uh, Vidal de la Blanche, uh, early 20th century French geographer, was interested in the, the concept of genre de vie. As he, as he called it, it was a ways of life of peoples. It was a very much of a bottom-up, let's try to understand these communities and how they live and work together and they're, they're in, in relationship to, to others. That was a tradition that uh, still has inertia today in, in France. Uh, in the German case, um, it, was a, it was much more of an analytical, spatial concern. Uh, the Kantian idea that human beings are able to perceive a variety of what Kant would call forms, any tangible or intangible thing that you can give a, give a name to, but also time and space. And Kant was very influential in the development of the modern German university, which in turn had a huge influence on the US. And the very disciplinary structure reflected that Kantian idea. So it was these variety of disciplines concerned with different forms, economics and botany is the old term, or you know, politics. Uh, and then, well, but humans are also able to think in terms of perspective. So time and space was going to be history and geography. And that that's that was very important in the German tradition. It came over to the United States and it meant that there was a lot more what we would now call spatial analysis that became part of the German and the American tradition. But they've blurred a lot then, of course, over time as there's more as, as there's more interactions. And that's just in the Western tradition. You know, there are obviously some differences in the kinds of geographic uh, traditions that developed in this part of the world, in Japan and China, that I know I know much le less about. Um, but uh, one of the realities of the contemporary world, of course, is the hegemony of English, which is uh, a mixed bag, of course. I mean, any language that spells light, L-I-G-H-D, has no business being the world's hegemonic language. Uh, but um, but uh, the hegemony of, of English has meant that uh, if you just look in terms of citations and citation counts and so forth, there is an overwhelming influence now to English language journals. And this has actually had a big impact on the differences in geographic traditions not just the traditional ones in Europe, but actually uh, in much of the rest of, rest of the world as well. And it's given a very strong kind of Anglo-American imprint to uh, contemporary geography as it's practiced in many places. Thank you very much. That's really something we're very interested in because we, we if you do surveys of academic journals, one, and I think it's not only language, that's all the reasons for it, is Japanese are totally underrepresented. Uh, we've done surveys in economics, and continental Europeans are actually represented now at a fairly normal rate uh, because of, first, the academic systems are different, and secondly, uh, there's much of the language barrier, but that's been a big problem. With a lot of what is written in Japan, whether it's about geography or history, is written in Japanese journals in Japanese and basically remains unknown to the rest of the world. So thank you very much. We're very grateful to you and grateful to TAG for making this possible. As I, as I mentioned, we're a very poor university because the Japanese government doesn't support us, uh, because we're foreign, and because our 
uh, visitors don't contribute to our uh, donation boxes. So we can't offer you an honorarium, but we can offer you another bottle of mineral water. Excellent. Because you've been talking for an hour and a half. Just what I need. Uh, if you become more generous, we'll be able to offer some Tropicana orange juice the next time Alec comes. So thanks again. Thank you. And we'll see you, uh, see you next Monday. Uh, Osoya Sensei of Keio, who chaired the MOFA appointed committee on what Asia would be like in 2035. Uh, would enlighten us on what's ahead for the next 20 years. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.